Welcome to Brain Health with Dr. Nissen. It is good to be speaking with you all. It has been uh, a little while since my last show because I've been a bit tied up. Um, as some of you might have seen, I've been doing a lot of writing lately for ABC News and Good Morning America. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll be continue to put out some similar uh, information about health and about brain health um, on those uh, you know forms of media and also on their um, TikTok and um, Instagram pages as well. So check it out there if you are interested in this type of information and all sorts of information about health and about preventing brain disease. Today we're talking about neurotransmitters. So neurotransmitters you know, are, are th things that are kind of tossed around often as people are thinking about, uh, you know, wellness and about their brain health and about medicine. Uh, people talk about, you know, riding that dopamine surge or they talk about, you know, feeling, uh, you know, happy from the, all the serotonin that they have. And so there's a lot of uh, ways that this is talked about in ways that are probably inaccurate. And I think that it's really helpful for everyone, regardless of if you're in medicine or if you are, you know, in any other field in business or in engineering to just have some sort of familiarity with the different neurotransmitters so that you can understand also the impact that different psychotropic um, you know substances that we all enjoy like coffee or uh, like some people tobacco um, these are these are things that act via certain mechanisms and so it's good to understand those so today you'll be learning all about neurotransmitters and it will be part of a series about how the brain works so without further ado let's dive into uh, to neurotransmitters so the the first ones that I would like for us to start with are kind of the core of uh, brain uh, activity in sort of its um, you know most basic sense and that's GABA and glutamate so Glutamate, uh, th these work in opposing fashions. Uh, GABA is inhibiting. So uh, it, it, it's something that, uh, you know, you could think of as sort of relaxes you. Um, and, uh, and glutamate is the opposite. It's excitatory. So it's what leads to uh, neurons firing. It's what's involved in learning, memory, and synaptogenesis or the creation of synapses. So these work in opposing fat in opposing fashions. You don't want to be totally activated all the time because uh, actually glutamate itself can damage the neurons if there's too much of it at once. And uh, similarly, you don't want to have too much GABA because that will inactivate certain uh, certain uh, important areas of the brain. Um, so uh, it, I think it's interesting to look through these through the lens of commonly used substances or drugs that people use. So a really interesting way to understand GABA and glutamate is with alcohol. So alcohol works through, it's kind of a sloppy uh, drug or a sloppy uh, um, a psychotropic uh, substance uh, because uh, it, it works through a lot of mechanisms, but, but one of the main mechanisms it works through is GABA. And so it that's why it tends to lead you to uh, feel more relaxed and to feel uh, more disinhibited because normally uh, it's that active prefrontal cortex of your brain that is uh, inhibiting you from doing the stupid things or saying the stupid thing. Um, that you know it requires energy it requires activation and so the GABA from alcohol um, leads you to uh, not have that inhibition and so you do more foolish things and so what happens in somebody who's a chronic uh, alcohol drinker somebody with an alcohol use disorder is that they're having so much GABA that your body's trying to maintain this balance between the GABA and glutamate and so what happens is as you raise the GABA with your alcohol the glutamate will rise as well in your body to try to keep that equilibrium. And so then suddenly when you stop drinking alcohol, the GABA drops, but your glutamate is still high um, because your body had artificially kept it high to keep up with your with your artificially high GABA levels. And so that really high glutamate compared to GABA when you suddenly stop drinking alcohol is what causes a seizure. So seizure is like an electrical wave moving through the brain. It is the definition of, of activation, of, of neuronal activation. And so if you suddenly take away that gum and you have all this glutamate, 
boom, you have a seizure, which is one of the most common things that happens when you uh, have uh, alcohol withdrawal. So uh, that's a really good way, I think, to kind of understand the balance between glutamate and GABA. Um, and like I said, uh, the, the danger with having too much glutamate is that you have this risk of seizures. Um, and so this is why we worry about, uh, you know, if you have a prolonged seizure, uh, you have, uh, you, you, you risk damaging your nerves from having too high glutamate for too long. Something that's important to keep in mind here is that uh, there's there may be some evidence that in people that have depression that there's lower levels of both GABA and glutamate. Um, and nevertheless, it's there's been some evidence to show that exercise is one uh, mechanism that may be able to help reestablish that balance of GABA and glutamate. So uh, there is, uh, and also exercise can help to break down glutamate, excess glutamate. So like I said, you know, it can be damaging to have too, too much glutamate and exercise is a way to perhaps uh, heal that depression and also to uh, protect yourself against having too much um, glutamate. And so if you wanted to try to raise your GABA levels, you can try to do um, more relaxing or inactivating activities from time to time. Things can, these can be things like deep breathing exercises, mindfulness, or meditation. Um, there's been some evidence that those can help to uh, raise your GABA levels as well. Um, so it's important then, like I said, given the negatives of glutamate to avoid uh, having too much glutamate from your food sources. So this is where all of this uh, hoopla around MSGs comes from. You might have heard of monosodium glutamate. You might see bottles saying free of MSGs. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, something that's common in Chinese cooking. Um, and so it's something that you want to avoid because it's a source of, of extra uh, glutamate in your in your body. Similarly, aspartame, which is an artificial sweetener, uh, uh, is uh, easily transformed into some of the glutamate precursors in the body. So it's important to avoid it for that reason as well. Um, so, you know, I think that understanding GABA and glutamate will help to give you some understanding for some of the different drugs that are out there. If you have a family member that's... Um, uh, and that has Alzheimer's disease. There are uh, different me uh, medications that will act via glutaminergic um, activities. Uh, so that is, in summary, the thoughts I had about GABA and glutamate. So uh, the next thing that I wanted to go into is acetylcholine. So this is actually a natural transition from what I was just talking about in Alzheimer's disease. There are a few mechanisms of, uh, of the drugs used in Alzheimer's disease that go down the glutamine path and there are some or glutamate path and there are some that go down the path of acetylcholine. So acetylcholine is another neurotransmitter. Um, it's something that you can think of as being involved in learning and memory, but really it has pretty diverse um, actions in the brain. Uh, but I think of it as a very sort of um, uh, non-specific sort of firing neurotransmitter in our thought processes. And so that's why in Alzheimer's disease, there, uh, there may be some role for these acetylcholine drugs to help people to think a little bit more sharply or, or clearly. So uh, many Alzheimer's drugs uh, are acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. So uh, we have acetylcholine, it's broken down by these enzymes, acetylcholinesterase. And so what we want to do in Alzheimer's disease is give something to inhibit that breakdown so that you leave more of the acetylcholine in the synapse. And so that's the idea with this acetylcholine esterase inhibitors used in Alzheimer's disease. Um, so acetylcholine is something, you know, like I said, being involved in thinking and memory, it's important to avoid things that can get in the way of that. And one of the main ways that we can have problems with this is by taking medications that are known as being anticholinergic. So this is something that is so common. It's so common in the hospital, so common in medicine, um, but it it's, should be really common knowledge for you know daily people of trying to avoid medications that you're taking unnecessarily that have um, acetylcholine uh, or anti, anticholinergic effects. So, uh, so what this means is that these medications uh, basically get in the way of our body's uh, use of acetylcholine to think clearly and have good memory. So uh, 
let me see if uh, some of the, the most common ones to, to keep in mind here. So uh, diphenhydramine, so this is something you may use for uh, sleep or allergies, uh, Benadryl. Uh, diamond hydronate, uh, it's used for motion sickness. Um, oxybutynin is a common medication used for overactive bladder. Uh, similarly, in the world of psychiatry, there's medications like paroxetine, which is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor that has um, some anticholinergic effects. Cetirzine, again, another uh, allergy medication, might have some amount of this um, effect. Um, loratadine, also an antihistamine, might have some anticholinergic effects. Uh, ranitidine, a heartburn medication. So, uh, you know, you could probably uh, look online or I'll try to uh, post, you know, some of the most common anticholinergic medications, but because these mess with your brain's ability to, uh, anticholinergics mess with your brain's ability to think clearly and have good memory, it's important to avoid them uh, when not completely necessary to take them. So be careful with those allergy medications, be careful with those motion sickness medications, with those over-the-counter sleep aids, and always ask your psychiatrist about you know the uh, possible anticholinergic effects of, of different uh, psychiatric medications as well because uh, it's definitely a consideration um, to take as well. So uh, there's some evidence that that these anticholinergic medications, you know, if you take a large amount of them, you can get very sick. So there's this, uh, in medical school, you learn this, and blind is a, a blind is a bat, so you get dilated pupils, you get red as a beet, so you get flushing, you get hot as a hair, so you get fever, dry as a bone, you get dry skin, and mad as a hatter, so you get confusion and short-term memory loss. Also bloated as a toad, you get urinary retention, um, and you can get a fast heartbeat. So um, there's some evidence, though. There's a study published in JAMA Neurology where uh, it found that those who regularly take these anticholinergic uh, drugs uh, like these over-the-counter sleep aids, muscle relaxants, allergy medications, uh, um, that they have lower brain volumes and enlarged ventricles, which uh, you know is the, the area of the brain that holds uh, some of your cere cerebral spinal fluid. So um, as well as lower glucose metabolism and shorter, uh, poorer short-term memory and executive function. So again, this is uh, more evidence that there's uh, that there's sort of an accumulative effect of taking anticholinergics over a long time. Um, and th there's also a possible connection between these anticholinergic medications and the risk of developing dementia later on. So um, there's a study out of the University of Washington uh, that demonstrated that those who regularly took anticholinergic medications had a greater risk of developing dementia than those who did not take them. Um, so, you know, there's, uh, you, if you are taking these medications, you may want to, uh, limit the amount of time that you're taking those medications. Um, and some, certainly if you know that you're somebody that's at increased risk of developing Alzheimer's. So if you have a uh, family history of Alzheimer's, or if, if you can do your, um, your genetic testing and find out whether you have the ApoE4 alleles, like I spoke about in other podcasts, these are uh, genes that specifically increase your risk of developing Alzheimer's dementia um, by quite large amounts. If you have one of them, uh, it increases a, a certain amount. And then if you have two of these ApoE4 alleles, then you're at very high risk of developing Alzheimer's dementia and, and may de develop it earlier. Uh, similarly, if you're somebody that has you know metabolic risk factors, so if you're somebody that has uh, cholesterol issues, blood sugar issues, um, um, and blood pressure issues, then it's definitely uh, worth taking this even more seriously, the avoidance of these medications that are known as being anticholinergic. Um, so and uh, probably the final thought here that I would have on acetylcholine, an important neurotransmitter, is that you need to allow your body to make enough acetylcholine. So how do you do that? You do that by taking in adequate choline. So choline is actually a nutrient that a lot of Americans are deficient in. Uh, you can find it in seafood, you can find it uh, in egg yolks. Uh, it is in some uh, vegetables like Brussels sprouts, broccoli, spinach, 
Um, so, you know, you can uh, try to increase your consumption of this. This is one of the reasons why it's probably terrible advice to uh, consume only egg whites instead of uh, full eggs or egg yolks. Um, egg yolks are so nutritious, and uh, if you can get pasture raised eggs where they're eating, um, you know, a more diversified uh, food, um, more diversified food sources like, um, you know, bugs in addition to plants, you're going to see that those egg yolks are going to be different colors, and that's because of all the nutrients that are in there. Choline is one of the main things that you'll get there. There will be about 125 milligrams of choline in each egg yolk, uh, and it's recommended that you get about 550 milligrams per day in males. So that would be roughly four to five um, eggs, um, you know, if that were your only source, but you can mix it up having some broccoli and Brussels sprouts as, as well, um, and it would be 425 milligrams uh, per day in non-pregnant females. So uh, if you're somebody that doesn't eat eggs, um, you know, other options would be beef liver uh, or, like I said, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, and spinach are good sources as well. So uh, try to up your choline consumption to have better learning, better memory. Um, and so, you know, like I said, this is especially important because Americans, uh, you know, are, are deficient in choline uh, there's there's been a few different studies but it, it may be the case that uh, as many as 90 percent of americans aren't getting quite those recommended levels so try to increase that choline consumption for better memory and better learning all right so uh the next neurotransmitter that i wanted to talk about is serotonin so serotonin is maybe one of the most uh famous neurotransmitters out there because people have heard about it amongst all the hoopla about depression. So as many of you probably know, uh, for depression, the main class of medications that is uh, most commonly used would be selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs. Um, so a way to think about these is that you know, you have the neuron, uh, and sorry, you have the synapse, which is the space between two neurons, and uh, there's the neurotransmitters passing between here, and so you, uh, you know, you have a certain amount of serotonin in that synapse, and it's normally uh, brought into the body by reuptake, and the way that this uh, is is inhibited by these medications. Uh, allows for there to be effectively more serotonin in that synapse. So uh, that's the way that these SSRI uh, antidepressants work is that they uh, inhibit the removal of the serotonin from the synapse and allow there to be more serotonin there. Um, and it you know, it creates these effects that uh, I would say are still probably not very well understood of why it is that it helps so much with depression and um, and also with anxiety. Uh, but for some reason, having more serotonin there at the synapse has been found to be helpful. But serotonin uh, is has many other mechanisms that are uh, still being understood. So uh, one of them is, like you probably heard in one of my recent um, podcast episodes on psychedelics, is that uh, the psychedelic mechanism is largely through the serotonin 5 ht 2 2A receptor pathway. You may hear serotonin referred to as the happy neurotransmitter or the antidepressant neurotransmitter. It really uh, has kind of various mechanisms that, you know, in some ways it may help with depression, but in, others, in other ways it leads to these uh, hallucinogenic experiences of, you know, hallucinating seeing things or being. Uh, uh, psychotic really uh, for a defined period of time that's kind of, that's one way that they initially thought about these psychedelic medications is that they were a way to help us to understand what it's like to be psychotic or to have uh, schizophrenia active schizophrenia in a reversible fashion as you you take the LSD and then you would start to hallucinate or have um, uh, you know strange beliefs um, and that it would go away once the LSD would lay uh, would uh, would be removed and so you know similarly with psilocybin um, and even partially with MDMA or ecstasy uh, this is how it works is through that serotonin mechanism but specifically the serotonin 5-HT2A mechanism um, so uh, so for psilocybin like I had been discussing in that uh, most recent podcast uh, it works by 
um, by binding to or being an agonist of that 5-HG2A receptor. Um, and it, uh, aside from being a hallucinogenic um, drug, psilocybin um, and likely LSD um, have some sort of uh, depression mechanism. Psilocybin has been looked at for the treatment of depression, um, severe depression in people that were uh, recently diagnosed with a life-threatening cancer. Um, And this really uh, amazing research out of Johns Hopkins is showing that um, psilocybin can be very effective for uh, depressions, very acute depression and severe depression, like is seen um, in in that. If you have you know get this diagnosis of a life threatening cancer and you are feeling like you know uh, like your life is ending and that nothing's worth it and that you're uh, very you know uh, worried or overwhelmed, that it's very effective for that. But it may be effective as a treatment for uh, you know uh, for many people with depression who aren't uh, responding to other medications. So uh, this is another interesting way that serotonin is involved in depression. So serotonin, the way it comes uh, to be produced in the body is is important to understand because it affects our eating, it affects our use of antibiotics. So so tryptophan, which uh, is something that you may have heard about when people talk about eating turkey and Thanksgiving and they get sleepy, Um, it's... Uh, that, that's not really, uh, as far as I know, it doesn't seem like there's very much credence behind that. But a tryptophan, uh, you you consume it through proteins that you eat in your diet, um, and when it goes into the brain, it uh, then is. Uh, it first, it needs to be transported into the brain across the, b- the blood-brain barrier. Um, and so something that's really important to keep in mind here is that people, uh, very commonly weightlifters or, uh, or um, uh, you know, sort of people really trying to build muscle mass are taking these branched-chain amino acid um, supplements, BCAAs. You might see them at your grocery store or at the, um, you know, GMC. Uh, so these uh, actually are, you know, uh, they, these compete against tryptophan to be brought into the brain. And so it's important to keep in mind if you are somebody that's supplementing with these amino acids, with BCAAs, that, uh, you're, that you're careful with, uh, with not doing too much of that or with only doing it for a uh, short period of time because uh, it, if you are constantly you know, bombarding your body with these BCAAs, um, they're going to be getting transported uh, by these transporters into the brain, and the tryptophan is not going to be. And so you may have lower amounts of tryptophan, and we need this tryptophan because it's what goes on to produce serotonin. Um, so I'm not aware of, you know, tryptophan deficiency linked to depression, but it, you could think theoretically about, you know, the risks that there would be of taking these BCAAs and, um, uh, and possibly developing depression or some sort of serotonin uh, deficiency later on. So it's something to keep in mind. Um, uh, so there has been some, um, you know, some research around this and uh there has been shown that in in people that do take these bcaas uh regularly that they may be uh more aggressive have worse memory um and learning poor impulse control so possibly through this mechanism of serotonin depletion because you're not able to get enough tryptophan into the brain um so uh some some other ways that serotonin is um acted upon in the body is uh through um the the role of omega-3s for example so um epa is an omega-3 fatty acid uh which um can help in the release of serotonin from the neuron um so uh it's important that you're getting you know enough of your omega-3 fatty acids which primarily come from fatty fish uh, so try to get that good fatty fish consumption um, so that you can get enough of that serotonin release. Uh, similarly, vitamin D or sunlight uh, is, can be helpful. Uh, so it helps serotonin to be uh, produced from its precursor tryptophan. So, you know, vitamin D deficiency is rampant in the United States. Um, it may be affecting, you know, over half 
uh, likely, you know, around 75% of Americans um, being vitamin D deficient. So try to get that sunlight because it will help your body to convert that tryptophan into serotonin. All right, stay posted because we will have another episode coming out about dopamine and norepinephrine, which are two very important neurotransmitters that we didn't touch upon in this episode that are very important for our understanding of uh, diseases like schizophrenia, for uh, understanding how to learn better and have better memories. So, um, you know, ADHD medications and learning disabilities, uh, and also what we can do to make ourselves more engaged in our work and in our studies so that we can perform better. So check out that episode. It will be coming out. Follow Dr. Nissen on Instagram and on TikTok. Um, I've been putting out more and more information uh, on through those um, you know media outlets uh, and also that will be a lot of my content from uh, ABC News and Good Morning America on there so check that out um, and as always you know share this episode with your friends and uh, spread the word hopefully we can get uh, more listeners on here so that we can all be uh, better you know Uh, stewards of our brains the most amazing organ in the human body so that we can you know have the right diet have the right lifestyle so we can prevent brain diseases and prevent ourselves from feeling bad from having depression um, and to really live our best lives so share this with others and i wish you all an awesome week